It's hard to imagine anyone wishing their lake had fewer loons, poorer fishing, or murkier water. But plants and trees are a different story. Vegetation, a fundamental component of the shoreland environment, is often regarded as a nuisance. In fact, vegetation is the foundation upon which all other desirable aspects of shoreland are rooted. Scenery, wildlife, fish populations, even water quality, all are tied to a healthy supporting system of plants and trees. Without this, these other things will quickly decline or disappear. But vegetation can also be a powerful tool for preserving the natural qualities of shoreland. By using good management practices to establish and support native plant growth, lakeshore property can be developed, preserved, or enhanced in ways that will encourage positive results, both for the landowner and the environment. These are the benefits that come from a living shore. In its natural state, shoreland is teeming with life. From the very little to the very big, property bordering the water's edge is home to an astonishing variety of fish, animals, birds, plants, and in ever-increasing numbers, people. These scenic surroundings and the many recreational opportunities attract people to shoreland property like insects to a bright light. And like these bugs, this attraction has the potential for disaster. In the past, developing shoreland property was often synonymous with clearing off most of the native vegetation. With 20-20 hindsight, we now know that in these cases, our enthusiasm to carve out a place in this environment has sometimes worked against us. Clearing shoreland may have improved our view, but what we're seeing is increased erosion, greener lakes, and a distinct absence of wildlife. This is not a pretty picture. The abundant life this property once sustained is gone. Most of it went when the native plants were destroyed. Clearly, a healthy buffer of vegetation is vital to the well-being of shoreland. In fact, it fulfills several important functions, beginning with stabilizing the soil. The roots of plants and trees needle their way throughout the soil, binding it together like strong thread. If the vegetation is removed, pounding rains and hungry waves are free to nibble and chomp at a shoreline, resulting in unsightly erosion damage, pollution in the form of cloudy sediments, and a relentless and often expensive battle to keep the lake from gobbling up more and more property. The nutrients carried by runoff are another threat to water quality that is normally controlled by vegetation. A spongy layer of plants, roots, and topsoil will capture and absorb rainwater and nutrients. But on cleared ground, runoff flows directly into the lake, concentrating nutrients and feeding growths of green slimes and algae, a serious threat to lakes. Vegetation is also important habitat. Branches and leaves provide forage and shelter for many kinds of wildlife. To a bird or squirrel, cleared shoreland has all the attraction of a paved road. It's something to pass over on the way to greener pastures. Of course, land is only half the story of shoreland. These same principles also apply to vegetation in the water. Aquatic plants like bulrushes and wild rice form natural breakwaters that shield shoreland from wave erosion. These plants also consume nutrients that might otherwise nourish algae, and they provide important habitats for fish, waterfowl, turtles, and frogs. Finally, natural shoreland vegetation helps keep exotic species at bay. Clearing native plants creates a dangerous opportunity for exotics to step in and fill the void. Many are just milling around, waiting for the opportunity. For all these reasons, a living shore made up of native plants, animals, birds, and fish is the wise and healthy way to manage lakeshore property. But what about people? How do our needs fit into this picture? And are we going to need a machete just to get to the lake? It doesn't take a jungle to keep a lake healthy. Developing property so that it can be used and enjoyed while retaining or encouraging the important natural systems 
is what best management practices are all about. How this will be done depends a lot on the property itself. Whether it's an undeveloped lot on a wild lake, or whether the property has undergone previous or even extensive development in the past. This property was completely wild when we bought it, but that's what appealed to us. We wanted a natural environment, with lots of birds and animals. We liked the idea of being in the woods. Even though there are other cabins nearby, we still feel pretty tucked away here in the trees. We didn't want to lose that. We did want to be able to see the lake out our window and to have easy access down to the water and to be able to use the boat and so on. Best management practices will ensure that the wild qualities of undeveloped property are preserved. For this situation, shoreland editing is a simple solution. By selectively removing the vegetation, the area around the house can be opened and a lake view can be created. Editing can also be done to provide a lake access while maintaining a natural buffer along the shoreline and a leafy green fence around the entire property. Aquatic vegetation can be edited to allow boating and swimming, but an important erosion buffer and fish habitat are preserved. The key to living on the edge of a shoreline is minimizing your impact. If you need to make changes, make them as small as possible. Removing a tree here or a branch there, you may find that to get a view of the lake, if that's something you feel you need, you can receive that view or get a better view simply moving one or two branches from some place in the middle of a tree or a lower branch or removing one small tree without having to make a lot of changes. Remember that trees are the view, they don't block the view. Let's talk about height and sight lines. Think about where you'll be standing when you take a look at your view. You might find if your house is on a rise or moving up a, a steep slope or you have a two-story house that there's very little vegetation removal or even branch removal that you'd have to make to enjoy a particular view of the lake. If a big tree were to blow down into your lake or fall into the water, it may be best to leave it in the area, leave it in the water. It gives a great habitat for a lot of things and we find where big trees are in the water, many different fishes will move into the area. If fish are important to you, the last thing you want to do is disturb the underwater environment. If we need to put in a dock or want to put in a small area to sit by the water, then uh, do this with as little removal of aquatic vegetation as possible. Aquatic plants are to a lake what the trees are to the forest. We've been really happy with the results here. We have a beautiful view of the lake, but we still have our privacy. In fact, you have to work pretty hard to see the house from the lake. My wife is crazy about the birds. She loves the activity around the bird feeder. I like the big birds myself, the ducks and the loons. We may have a few more bugs than if we'd cleared everything out, but for all this, it's worth it. We're not the original owners of our cabin. Whoever first developed the property cleared the lot so that what we inherited was a grassy lawn and just a few trees left standing. Over the years, especially in big storms, we had a terrible time with erosion along the shoreline. We considered some sort of retaining wall or rock protection, but then we decided that if we're going to go through the effort, why not go all the way and restore the property to the way we would have left it had we owned it in the beginning. Besides stopping the erosion, our wish list included giving the property a more natural look, more in tune with the surroundings, and hopefully attracting more wildlife. Of course, the answer to all these problems was to try to bring back a lot of the native plants. Replanting native shoreland vegetation both on land and in the water is called shoreland restoration. Restoring a shoreline to a healthy, natural state requires effort and it won't happen overnight. But done properly, positive changes will take place and they will be worth the effort. Planning an effective lakeshore restoration first requires that you take a look at your property. What's the slope of the land? Where is the water in the spring? Where is it in the fall? And then you want to try to figure out what kind of plants would grow best there. And one way to do that is take a look at some existing lakeshore vegetation on your lake. Once you've decided what to plant, the next question is where to plant. The first thing you'll need to consider is what kind of use are you making of your property? How do you access the lake, for instance? You'll want to put your boat dock off to the side as far as possible, put your beach right next to it, and leave the maximum amount of area available for your revegetation project. Then what you'll need to decide is how much to plant. It's really a matter of taste. You can plant your entire property. In fact, that would give the lake the maximum benefits. But what you need to do is plant at least 25 feet to ensure that lake quality improves as a result of your project. 
It's important to remember that when you're planting in the water, you're actually planting on public land. And so what you'll want to do is contact your local Department of Natural Resources to assist you in obtaining the necessary permits. They'll also provide you some valuable information to help you get started. A big question is, where do I get the plants for a project like this? Luckily, many local nurseries will carry native plant materials. Be sure the plants that you obtain from your nursery originate in your local area. In that way, the plants will be most likely to be adapted to your climatic conditions. Try to avoid taking plants from one part of the lake and transferring them to your property. The problem with that is it'll decimate natural populations and also could transfer exotics from one part of the lake to another. When you're planting the upland area, be sure you're considering where the shade is most of the day and where you have sun when selecting the plants for that particular part of the property. The land that sometimes is saturated will consider a wet meadow. When planting the meadow, consider how long it's saturated during the year to select the right plants. Also consider the amount of wave impact that that portion of your property receives. And when you're planting in the water, you'll want to keep a few things in mind because the plants there are going to be very vulnerable to that wave action. You want to anchor those plants well during planting, and you'll also want to consider putting up some special protection so that the waves aren't coming in at full strength to your shoreline. Restoring lakeshores takes some thought and it takes some time. It may take three to five years before your project fully matures. Remember to tell your neighbors that you haven't just failed to mow your lawn, but in fact, you're creating a healthy piece of shoreland property. It took a while, but the results were worth the wait. It's been like a rebirth. The shore is alive again with birds and frogs. The whole place just looks and feels so much better. Our erosion problem is stabilized. Most waves don't even seem to make it in past the reeds now. And the water plants are also attracting fish. The kids are even catching sunfish right off the dock. I think the greatest pleasure of this entire project is watching cobwebs grow on my lawnmower. Now I can enjoy myself on weekends instead of having to slave away at yard work. We've lived on this lake for nearly 20 years now, and in that time we've seen a big drop in water quality. I used to be able to see minnows on the bottom off the end of the dock, but now I can't even see the bottom because of all the weedy green stuff. This concerns us a great deal. We wanted to do something to help the lake, and if we could manage to spruce up our yard a bit at the same time, well, so much the better. Even with highly developed lakeshore properties, there are ways that vegetation can be used to achieve positive results. Results that will please the property owner and benefit the environment. One practical way to reduce nutrient runoff from urban lakeshore properties is to reduce maintenance, particularly mowing and fertilizing. In addition, planting colorful native flowers, shrubs, or grasses will help absorb nutrients while attracting birds and other desirable wildlife. In an urban setting, you can do a lot to help protect lake water quality by actually doing very little. And by that I mean reducing your maintenance on the lakeshore. Instead of mowing all the way down to the lake, take uh, some of that area and leave it as a natural buffer. Ideally, the wider the buffer, the better. But even just a narrow buffer, even of 5 to 10 feet, will provide a filter strip to keep the pollutants and nutrients out of the lake that cause the blue-green algal blooms that we don't like to see in our lakes. In terms of fertilizing, determine exactly what you need to keep your lawn healthy. A simple, inexpensive soil test will tell you what you need. In many cases, you'll find that phosphorus, which is harmful to the lakes, is not needed on your lawn. A good turf lawn actually can do a pretty good job of filtering runoff uh, before it gets to the lake. It's really the way that we maintain that turf that can be a problem for the lake. Planting a few wildflowers on your property can add color as well as attract wildlife. In an urban setting, the bottom line is there's no such thing as a piece of property that can't be improved by planting or encouraging vegetative growth to protect water quality. These wildflowers are just wonderful. They look beautiful and they've brought butterflies and hummingbirds into our yard. We've asked the boy who cuts our lawn to stop mowing down by the water. Leaving some uncut grass down here is not too much to ask, especially when we know that it will help save our lake. Just as our lakes extend well beyond the boundaries of our own properties, so must our efforts to help keep them healthy. Working as a community, through lake associations to devise management plans for an entire lake and the surrounding watershed is just one way to increase our opportunities and benefits many fold. Considering vegetation other than our own also means boating thoughtfully, particularly near shore or in shallow water where thrusting propellers and wakes can devastate underwater plant communities. 
Doing the right thing requires a firm understanding of the issues at hand. To this end, a number of state and local agencies have worked together to produce some excellent resources for learning more about shoreland best management practices, including how to manage vegetation. This information is available from the organizations listed at the end of this program. Information like this is the key to making good decisions. However our lake properties have been developed in the past, whatever our goals are for the properties today, our actions will significantly impact the fragile zone of life defined by our shorelands. Whether these impacts will be positive or negative depends, to a large extent, on how we manage the native vegetation. By choosing wisely and using best management practices like shoreland editing and restoration, we can avoid the pitfalls of barren lots and green lakes and enjoy the many pleasures that come from a healthy, living shore.